Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, if you're new to the conference, we're using a platform called Zoom Events, which is a new platform. Um, and so as folks join us, they get moved from the lobby into the main um, event. And also sometimes it's been taking folks a little longer to log in. So we wanted to give a couple minutes for that. I still see we've got folks trickling in. Before we get to our main speaker today, I'm just going to give some opening remarks and share with you a little bit about what's um, teed up here as folks are joining. Um, so again, if you're joining us today, this is the second day of the Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference. I'm Kylie Goslin. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. We are a organization dedicated to ending homelessness and expanding housing opportunity here in the state, particularly ensuring that everybody here has a safe, stable home that is affordable to them in an equitable community of their choice. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we work to develop original research, um, public and educational content, as well as state and federal legislative activity. Uh, you can find us at pschousing.org for more information. Uh, as well as the conference webpage, which is also there, which has today's lineup of sessions and tomorrow's as well. So over the, these three days of this conference, we're exploring, exploring a variety of topics, all surrounding how we can drive affordable housing policy and programmatic changes that support our state's recovery and close the gap on our housing needs. As I mentioned, we have a full day of sessions covering everything from capacity building, in the community development sector to development of mixed income, mixed use and historic structures, including focusing on some challenges that have arisen for the development community during the pandemic. Um, and at 1 p.m. we're gonna host a discussion with members of the Housing and Planning Development Committees of our state legislature who are gonna explore topics including bonding, housing development, zoning, COVID related housing concerns and more. So I'd invite you again to check out the full slate of uh, sessions for today and tomorrow, um, and feel free to join any of them using the lobby and the session link that you already logged in with today. Tomorrow, we're going to hear opening remarks from Nathanina Trajan, our CEO of Chaffa, followed by a keynote address from Richard Rothstein. Uh, he's the author of The Color of Law. If you have not read it, highly recommend it. It um, covers a forgotten history of how our government segregated America following on a lot of the themes that we talked about yesterday regarding racial inequalities in housing um, and the history of how we've gone to this place here in Connecticut. Please note though, that there's a separate link to the session for Richard Rothstein that is available um, on our website. It's also on the Zoom platform. So if you will want to attend that session tomorrow, please note that it is a separate link. We'll be reminding folks of that um, throughout the day today. We want to make sure that everybody knows that and is able to get on that. Uh, afternoon tomorrow, we have some sessions focusing on the qualified allocation plan, the new one that was just released by Chaffa. Uh, more focus on zoning, some conversation around energy efficiency and housing, accessory dwelling units, and also equitable home ownership. Uh, and so, of course, none of this is possible without the support of some sponsors who really stepped up this year to help make this conference a success and make it free for everybody, which it was important to us and is important for our mission. So I'll run through some sponsors here with you. Thanks to our leading sponsors and our critical partners, Connecticut Housing Authority, Webster Bank, um, particularly and always a thanks to the Melville Charitable Trust for their longtime ongoing support of PSC. Uh, the Connecticut Department of Housing, Rockport Mortgage and Webster Bank also. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of supporting sponsors that have helped to make the conference happen, including Beacon, Capital for Change, Corporation for Supportive Housing, Elm City Communities, Fairfield County's Community Foundation, Federal Home Loan Bank Boston, JHN Group, List Connecticut, National Equity Fund, and Trinity Financial. Thank you so much to all of you. And as you'll see throughout the day, we have additional sponsors that have stepped up to set um, to support particular sessions and a host of other um, sponsors that have helped make the conference happen. So you can find all the full list of sponsors on our website and thank you again to them. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, uh, Diane Yantel with the National Income Housing Coalition, I wanna let you know that we'll be hosting a Q&A session with Diane at the end of her remarks. 
So during the session, I'm going to ask that you put those remarks in the Q&A link at the bottom, not the chat, and we'll see if we can make that happen. And then I'll do my best um, to feed those questions to Diane, um, try to group them if necessary. So thank you again um, for participating today. If you have questions, please put them in that Q&A. So uh, without further ado, I think it's safe to say that our keynote speaker has had a busy couple of years. Our country's housing, housing shortage came into the sharpest of views during the pandemic. And as you all know, advocates and state and local officials really jumped into action in the last 18 months in an attempt to prevent a massive wave of evictions and homelessness. And meanwhile, our next speaker and her amazing staff were at the forefront of the national battle with Congress to raise the topic of racial inequities in housing, fund housing relief, establish and continue eviction moratoriums, and fight for longer term resources to address the ongoing housing shortage that our country in Connecticut continues to face. Diane Yantel is the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. She's a veteran of affordable housing policy, has been in this space for decades. And before rejoining the National Low Income Housing Coalition, where she was previously a policy analyst, she was VP of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Enterprise Community Partners, also a sponsor of this conference, where she led federal, state, and local policy research and advocacy programs. And prior to Enterprise, Diane was the director of the Public Housing Management and Occupancy Division at HUD. She also worked to advance affordable housing policies with Oxfam America and the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless and served for three years as a community development Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia. So thank you, Diane, for joining us today. We're happy to have you here and eager to hear what you have to share with us. So take it away. Great, hello, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for that introduction uh, and for the opportunity to be here. And many thanks to the Partnership for Strong Communities and your partners throughout Connecticut for your leadership and your important work. These last 20 months have clearly been one of the most extraordinary and difficult times in our lives. Yet so many of you rose to the challenge of working to keep unhoused people and low income and marginalized renters safe, healthy, and housed during this unprecedented global health crisis. And I'm grateful for your work. The last year and a half have truly been a watershed moment. It showed us in really profound and unforgettable ways who we are as a country, and we can't go back. 2020 showed us the deep structural racism on which our country and so many of its systems was built and how that structural racism harms and can kill black, indigenous and people of color. And it made clear our collective responsibility to repair this deep injustice, to work towards racial and housing justice. The year revealed the collective harm that comes from allowing homelessness and housing poverty to persist. There's nothing quite like a highly contagious and deadly disease to make clear that housing is healthcare. It always has been. And that stable, safe, affordable, accessible homes are a prerequisite to personal and public health. The year revealed the pervasive housing crisis for the lowest income people who struggled so mightily to pay the rent pre-pandemic and during the pandemic and who will continue to struggle after the pandemic unless and until the federal government invests in solutions to make homes affordable to the lowest income people. And the year showed us as housing advocates, organizers, providers, tenant leaders, impacted people, how deep and broad is our movement for housing justice and how powerful and effective we can be when we work together. Because as difficult as the year and a half have been, we rose to the challenge and achieved unprecedented resources and protections for renters and unhoused people. At the National Income Housing Coalition, we've been doing disaster recovery work for several years. And I think it was because of that work, we recognized very early in the pandemic that it was the latest disaster to hit our country, certainly on a new unprecedented scale and scope, 
but with likely all the same patterns of other disasters of harming the lowest income and the most marginalized people and communities the most, and of leaving them behind in the recovery without focused advocacy. We knew, as all of you do, that the pre-pandemic housing crisis would only be exacerbated when the 10 million low-income households who were already paying over 50% of their income before the pandemic started losing jobs or hours at work or wages and had increased health and childcare and internet costs during the pandemic. And we knew that people experiencing homelessness were at extremely high risk of contracting, spreading, becoming very sick from and dying from COVID-19. And we knew that people of color were most at risk of harms from the pandemic. Decades of structural racism in multiple systems created tremendous racial disparities in housing and homelessness. Pre-pandemic, people of color were disproportionately likely to be renters, to be extremely low income, to pay over half of their income towards their rent, or to become homeless. The pandemic compounded these inequities. Black and Native Americans were disproportionately likely to contract and die from COVID-19. Black and Latino workers were disproportionately harmed by historic job losses. And as a result, Black, Latino, and Native American people were disproportionately likely to fall behind on their rent. So very early in the pandemic, knowing the harm to come, we mobilized advocates from across the country to get immediate resources for addressing the urgent needs of people experiencing homelessness. $5 billion in emergency solutions grants to be used to move unhoused people to safety. And we got Congress to implement a limited federal eviction moratorium. After the passage of the CARES Act, we launched, led, and mobilized together with nearly 2,300 organizations across the country, including many of you in Connecticut, around our collective demand for rent relief now. Together, we called for a broad national eviction moratorium and emergency rental assistance. And our collective advocacy was tremendously successful. Together, we achieved a national eviction moratorium, which while flawed, was the first of its kind in the history of our country and kept tens of millions of renters stably housed during the pandemic. We were successful in getting that moratorium implemented by a Republican president, extended by a bipartisan Congress, and further extended multiple times and by the last time, only after tremendous advocacy and political pressure by, politi by President Biden. We were successful in getting Congress to provide a combined $46.5 billion in emergency rental assistance, a completely unprecedented amount of assistance for renters to address the rent and utility arrears that accrued during the pandemic. And we were successful in getting Congress to provide additional assistance to address homelessness and provide some longer term housing stability with emergency housing vouchers. We now have nearly $12 billion in funding that could house at least 130,000 unhoused people. All told, our collective action achieved almost $87 billion in housing and homelessness during the pandemic, a truly remarkable effort only made possible through the advocacy of all of you in Connecticut and others throughout the country. So again, thank you for your powerful advocacy and organizing, but clearly we are not done. We have so much more to do. Six and a half million households remain behind on rent, having fallen behind during the pandemic. For them, the moratorium was a lifeline and it was the last federal protection keeping them stably housed during the pandemic. They are disproportionately people of color. Today, 27% of black renters are behind on rent and 19% of Latino renters are behind on rent. That's compared with 10% of white renters. Now, as the Delta variant continues to surge and strain hospitals throughout the country and with the federal eviction moratorium no longer in effect, these families are at heightened risk of losing their homes this winter. 
we must work with new urgency to ensure that the unprecedented resources that Congress provided for emergency rental assistance reaches tenants in time to keep them stably housed. And Connecticut, after early challenges and some hard fought lessons learned, has become an example of how to do so. Connecticut's emergency rental assistance program got off to a very shaky start with burdensome documentation requirements, complex and overly long applications, partial payments, and little community outreach. As a result, the program was among the slowest spenders in the country. But to the credit of the governor, the legislature, organizers, advocates, program administrators, Connecticut has dramatically improved its ERA program, having course corrected and adopted proven best practices. Now the state pro program has obligated 100% of its ERA one allocation. So many thanks and kudos to all involved in those improvements. Please keep improving and keep up the good work on that. And we, clearly we can't stop there. These historic resources that we achieved were only ever to maintain some housing stability during the pandemic. They do little to nothing to address the underlying housing crisis that existed pre-pandemic and will continue post-pandemic. It is the gaping holes in our social safety net that brought us time and again to the brink of an eviction tsunami during a global health emergency. We must address that underlying housing crisis, repair our housing safety net, and now is the opportunity to do so. We have an extraordinary moment of opportunity before us. It is at minimum a generational opportunity and it is right now. And I know that so many of you, so many of us are tired. You have worked so hard throughout the pandemic. You have often done your work at the expense of your own health, understaffed, overwhelmed with competing urgent needs and limited resources to meet them. And you have been urging policymakers to act. And each time, each ask from us is more urgent, more historic than the last for over 20 months. And I am grateful for all of the work that you continue to do. And I know that you are tired, <laughs> but we can't stop now. This moment before us is the moment we have been waiting decades for. These next few weeks will be hugely consequential in our collective efforts to end homelessness and housing poverty in our country. These weeks will determine whether Democrats are able to use their majority to make historic and long overdue investments in getting and keeping the lowest income people affordably housed. Many are calling this moment once in a generation. I believe it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. In my 20 plus years of doing this work on housing and, the, and homelessness, there has never been a moment like this where so many factors aligned to create the opportunity to end homelessness that we have before us. Everything that we've done has led to this moment. We have built a movement for housing justice that is stronger and broader than ever. We have pushed presidential candidates to elect a president who, unlike any president before him, frames housing as a human right and has called for universal housing vouchers. We have built and worked with tremendous congressional champions who are leading the fight in Congress for housing investments. We've built strong bipartisan support for solutions. If not in Congress, then certainly throughout the country. And we've created momentum with policy and organizing success during the pandemic. All of these factors lead us to this moment when Congress and the White House are negotiating the Build Back Better Act with investments that would be transformational through our efforts to house the lowest income people in our country. The bill includes $65 billion for public housing repair and preservation. 
to make nearly 1 million affordable homes that house predominantly people of color to be decent, quality, accessible homes. This would be the largest infusion of public housing capital repair dollars in the program's history. The bill includes $25 billion in rental assistance for over 300,000 new housing choice vouchers, the largest expansion of Section 8 since the program's inception in 1974. The bill includes $15 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund to build or preserve over 150,000 homes affordable to the lowest income people, the largest funding level in the program's history. Taken together, this would be the most substantial federal investment in quality affordable homes for our country's lowest income people in our country's history. We have worked decades for this moment. And if this moment passes, it may not come again for perhaps as long. Now is the moment to do all we can to ensure that the Build Back Better Act is enacted and that the housing investments remain. So please keep calling your members of Congress. I have long said that homelessness and housing poverty are a choice, not by the people who experience it, but by the policymakers who advance public policies that exacerbate or maintain it. We can choose otherwise. We have long had the solutions and as a country, certainly we have the resources. We have only ever lacked the political will to fund solutions at the scale necessary. Together we have built that will and now we have the opportunity to use it to make a historic investment towards racial and housing justice. I truly believe that if we get this right, many years from now, we will look back and remember 2020 as the year of the pandemic, the year that changed us all, and 2021 as the year we began to end homelessness and housing poverty once and for all. So thank you again so much for the opportunity to be here today and for all of your good advocacy and work in the, in the recent months and many thanks in advance for your advocacy in the weeks ahead. It's truly never been more important. Thank you. Thanks so much, Diane. You can hear the virtual applause um, <laughs> in your head. Thank you. I know everyone's excited to hear a lot of what you just had to say about what's on the horizon. Um, for for the at the federal level and the Build Back Better bill. Um, I just want to remind folks if you have questions to drop them in the Q&A link. Um, but I want to start by um, going back to your conversation about racial equities and inequities in housing, Diane. Um, you highlighted really well the, um, the outcomes and the connections that we are all, I think many of us, at least here today, are have learned more about in the last couple of years and are very, very um, interested in trying to remedy. So curious to hear sort of what actions the National Income Housing Coalition is taking, what actions you're pushing at the federal level in order to continue to raise that topic up for those who are it's still learning about that, but where can we really move the needle on those racial inequities um, at the federal level in your opinion? And what, what, is the, what is NLIHC focused on in that space? Sure, I think there's multiple things that we can and, and, and must do. Um, first, to your question about what can be done at the federal level, um, you know, many of these investments that we have been pursuing and that we will hopefully achieve soon um, will be historic and transformational and necessary in helping to address affordable housing and homelessness in local communities. But if we don't also do the work at the federal, state, and local level to center racial equity in how those programs are designed and implemented and administered, then we won't have been successful at all. So at the federal level, we have to ensure that we're not only asking for the money, but that we're pushing for the program reforms that are needed to make sure that these investments work for people of color who are most harmed by the housing crisis in the first place. So for example, the Section 8 voucher program is tremendously successful in ending homelessness and housing poverty. There are reams of research to show it. And 
the program needs to be improved to better work for black and brown renters. We need um, federal and, and or state and local protections against source of income discrimination, just as an example, to go along with the Section 8 voucher program. And similarly, when we talk about um, the Housing Trust Fund program and we talk about the possibility of local communities having new funds to build and preserve homes affordable to extremely low income people, as long as uh, restrictive local zoning laws are in place that are often very much rooted in race and racism. As long as those, uh, those uh, zoning laws are in place, we won't be able to build these apartments. So work has to be done at the state and local level as well. And then I would just say too that, um, well, one more thing on the federal level is that another sort of buckets of solutions that we have been pushing for through our housed campaign that we're not able to achieve in the Build Back Better Act are really important um, protections for renters. And we know that, um, again, renters are disproportionately people of color. And certainly when we look at who gets evicted most often, it is predominantly black women. And much of that is rooted in this power imbalance that tilts very heavily in favor of landlords at the expense of low-income renters. So we have to push for a whole host of uh, protections for renters like source of income discrimination, but also right to counsel and just cause evictions, a lot of which you all have been doing really good work on in Connecticut. These are the kind of uh, local protections that need to be in place as well. And then I would say too that at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, we have also been doing work internally to think about how as an organization, we are uh, centering and, and amplifying racial equity. Um, and so we have been doing a number of trainings with our board and with our staff. We have just created and filled a new leadership position at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a senior vice president for racial equity, diversity and inclusion to help lead this effort to ensure that we're not only pushing for racial equity um, to be centered in the policies that we pursue, but also in our culture and in our, in our ways of working as an organization. And through that, our partners at the state and local level as well. Um, some questions sort of popping up in the chat as I'm going through, um, but one, one that came up was about where the Unite CT money, in our, in our case, that's our state um, yeah, rental relief program, um, is going. And so I just want to note um, for the person who asked that question, I think it was Michelle, um, that the Department of Housing does have a data dashboard that includes a whole host of data on um, race and ethnic background, as well as geographic distribution of those resources and utility arrearages and average payments and, and all of that, which is great. Um, and so maybe if there's um, a partnership person on, um, on the call that can drop that in the chat and share that with folks so they can see that would be helpful. But one of the questions the partnership had as these programs started to roll out, Diane, was, was the long-term questions, right? It was important that we got these programs up and running and getting this money out the door quickly. But also, as you said, this is a historic investment and we really have a chance to learn from these resources, learn what's worked, what investments have had the biggest impact on people. And so tracking that data is really important. Um, and so curious to hear your thoughts on, um, one, ensuring that the resources have been appropriately are being appropriately distributed, but two, the importance of learning from those for future investments, both at the federal and the state level. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And we we have been, um, since since spring of 2020 at the National Income Housing Coalition, we started tracking all emergency rental assistance programs that were being created during the pandemic. So by end of 2020, even before the first tranche of the 46 billion was appropriated, we were already tracking about 600 emergency rental assistance programs that were created with much smaller pots of money that were made available um, under the CARES Act. And then of course, since the 46 billion has been appropriated, we're now tracking an additional 500 programs that are using those resources. <coughs> and you know, we, we, we started doing that work. That's very different new work for the National Income Housing Coalition. Our work has always been focused almost entirely on advancing the federal policies not on the implementation when the policies are passed or the funding right. is appropriated. But we knew really early on, as you say, 
how important it would be for us to be able to show very clearly that this money was being used for its intended purposes and for us to learn all of the lessons along the way on how to get it right sooner next time. Yeah. Um, and also to be able to continue to make the case for the long-term uh, investments that we know are most needed because if we couldn't prove that this money could be sp spent well, how could we convince Congress to provide the tens of billions more that we need, know are needed for the long-term solutions? So through that process, we have been kind of pulling out what are the obstacles, what are the best practices. We've been working very closely with the White House and the Department of Treasury to be able to lift up some of the challenges as we see them so that they can correct or improve uh, or put out new guidance. Um, and we've been working with program administrators and with states and cities to help them improve their programs as well. We've shined a spotlight on the places where it wasn't working well, like in Connecticut. Yeah. You know, Connecticut has become one of those examples like Texas was for a while too, as a program that got off with a really, um, a really rough start and was doing a lot of things counter to best practices. But then to the really to the credit of the leaders in Connecticut, um, we're willing to learn those lessons and course correct and improve programs. And now it it's one of the most one of the more successful programs. So that kind of course correction and willingness to learn as we go and sort of iterate these programs as we create them is essential to the long term success. Yeah, um, we have been working too on. Uh, wanting to ensure, as I know you're thinking of in Connecticut, that you know all of this time and effort and energy that's gone into building this new program and this new infrastructure at the local level, um, ensuring that that is maintained and that we keep that infrastructure for the next natural disaster or the next pandemic, or even better, just for the kind of permanent emergency rental assistance resources that we really need to help people who generally can make ends meet, have an unexpected financial shock and need some cash to be able to stay housed. So that's another thing we're working on. And we were actually working on it pre-pandemic. We had bipartisan legislation introduced in the Senate since been in, reintroduced to create an emergency, a permanent emergency rental assistance program. Pre-pandemic, we were thinking of creating a pilot program now it feels like we've had our pilot program yeah. <laughs> during the pandemic. So now we're pushing to get those resources and have them be available at the state and local level permanently, again, to keep this, this program going. And the tracking that you mentioned, another real um, positive and improvement in Connecticut has been the public facing dashboard. So to not only be tracking the information um, internally, but to share it publicly so that we can all benefit from the lessons learned, what's working, what's not, continue to fill gaps and improve as we go. Yeah, thanks. Couldn't agree more. I know um, you talked, you touched on home ownership a little bit. Um, all right, so the folks in the in the um, in the chat and in the questions are touching on home ownership, and that's something that um, the partnership has been talking more about lately. And throughout this conference, there's been more conversation. Um, about closing the wealth gap, particularly for our BIPOC communities in home ownership and some of the many barriers that still remain, even with home ownership programs that often hamper folks um, and have prevented, um, again, particularly BIPOC communities from owning both multifamily and single family homes. Was wondering what, um, where sort of NLIHC stands on that work and what else you may be focused on or see coming on the horizon at the federal level in that home ownership space, particularly around racial inequities and the wealth gap. Yeah, well, to be honest, we at the National Income Housing Coalition, our focus is on extremely low income renters and people experiencing homelessness. And we're focused on that segment of the population because they are the only segment for which there's an absolute shortage of homes affordable and available to them. And when we look at who are extremely low-income renters, um, we know that about half of them are uh, seniors or people with disabilities who are on very limited fixed income who are unlikely to be able to become homeowners. Um, and we believe really strongly and want to keep a uh, focus on ensuring that they too have decent quality, affordable homes. So our focus is on um, those lowest income renters and the, the investments that we need 
to make to make apartments affordable to the lowest income people. We certainly do partner with organizations, um, especially like the National Fair Housing Alliance uh, and some others that worked to get um, in the pandemic relief bills, some funding to help homeowners um, who struggled far less than renters did during the pandemic because of other kind of protections that are automatically in place for them. Um, but are also working in the Build Back Better Act um, to enact an additional $10 billion for a new program for down payment assistance for first generation um, home buyers. And again, that's a program that is designed to um, make home ownership more possible for especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Thank you. Uh, you talked on a lot of the homelessness funds that have come through and the partnership operates two collective impact campaigns home connecticut around affordable housing and reaching home which has been in place for um almost 15 years now on the homelessness side and we've seen um, a sizable reduction um, more than 60 percent reduction in shelter use over the last really 10 years here in connecticut and over the pandemic, those new resources that came in to our homeless service systems through our coordinated access networks and beyond helped us to really decompress shelters, as everyone is doing, move folks into hotels, and then ultimately move a lot of those folks into permanent housing. The problem that we're seeing now, which I'm sure you're hearing about, is while we have more rental subsidies, um, rapid rehousing and, and others as a result of these new resources, a lot of the problems that our, our CANs and other providers are running into is now locating units in part because the housing market has shifted so drastically that where um, there were once available units, there are now not, um, properties are turning over, rents are increasing, and that's becoming a problem. So where we finally have some more uh, rental support for folks, um, we're unable, we're having a backlog and unable to place folks quickly, especially again, multi, um, bedroom units for families in particular. Uh, I know this is a problem that you're seeing nationally and the and the solution obviously, as we all know, is more multifamily housing and more affordable units, which take a long time to come. Uh, so are there best practices you're seeing in other places in the country and sort of getting through that hurdle that we are experiencing here as well? Sure, and yeah, and you, you, you all have done very good work um, on that too, and I want to commend you for that because it, it hasn't been the case um, throughout the country. Unfortunately, there's a surprisingly small number of communities that uh, took advantage of um, FEMA and other funds that were available to move people experiencing homelessness into hotels and motels. So I appreciate the work that you've done on this and the leadership that you showed. Um, the, and, it, and, and, and in doing so, you know, you took a leap of faith because it was always obvious that an exit strategy was going to be a real challenge. What, what next? If you have people who were previously homeless that are now in hotels or motels, certainly the, the, the end result of that can't be having people go back to the sidewalk or the bridges that they were sleeping under before the pandemic. Um, one piece of good news there, which you probably are all aware of, is that the 100% the uh, cost reimbursement from FEMA for those hotels and motels has been extended through spring of 2022. So there's a little bit more time to consider the longer term exit strategy. The other um, piece, as you said, has been not only the $5 billion federally in the home money that communities can use now to purchase some of these hotels and motels and convert them into permanent supportive housing, um, but also the $5 billion in emergency housing vouchers. And this being a really, um, you know, top priority use, I would say, for those vouchers yeah. is targeting them to people who are homeless and, and trying to get them into apartments. And then, but as you say, it's really, it's always been the longer term investments that are needed Right. Uh, to address the reason why any of these folks were homeless in the first place. And I would just point out there too that I mentioned the new investments um, in the Build Back Better Act of that 25 billion, first of all, the $25 billion in new housing vouchers, it's actually 24 billion in vouchers, 1 billion in project-based rental assistance. 
but the 24 billion of, of housing vouchers, they are all targeted to people who are extremely low income. And then of that 24 billion, there's 7.1 billion that are targeted towards people experiencing homelessness. So hopefully there will be another infusion of resources coming soon to communities to help get uh, people experiencing homelessness into safe and adequate and affordable housing. Yeah, thank you for that. One of the hurdles, as you know, here in Connecticut, we haven't built much of much multifamily housing in the state in decades, really. We, the state has moved largely towards um, single family construction and not even enough of that as it, as it was. But um, our stock of multifamily housing is older, it's aging, it's primarily in city centers. And a lot of that's due to zoning hurdles that we have here that I know are not unique to Connecticut, but I think are uh, particularly strong here in Connecticut, I'll say. Um, and it's something we've really struggled with. Our Home Connecticut campaign has advocated for years for um, changes to that. We have some other groups, um, Desegregate Connecticut, Open Communities Alliance, also pushing to try to um, change and reduce some of those barriers and uh, engage with municipalities to get them to see the benefit of um, allowing some multifamily um, and a little more density in um, what are your thoughts on, on that? And where have you seen, if any, um, progress either at the federal level or other states in moving towards reducing zoning barriers like minimum lot size or barriers to multifamily housing development period? Yeah, well, there's been some real success um, and progress in that recently in Minneapolis. It was, uh, it's been over a year now since they um, passed a new law that, um, essentially prohibits single family zoning anywhere. And the state of California has made some real progress recently. California has always stood out as kind of the example of what happens, of how badly it can go if you make it essentially illegal to build apartments in certain communities. Sure enough, it drives up costs for everybody as well as exacerbating and further entrenching racial inequity, segregation, and other inequities. Um, so the, and it's, it's just, it's one of those, it has been a long time, I think, that um, communities have used these kind of restrictive local zoning laws to you know, keep out others. Many of the local zoning laws are firmly rooted in race and racism, but all of them are rooted in sort of othering. Um, and that's a real challenge. And that kind of shift that needs to occur there, I think starts to happen when we have national conversations as we have been in recent years around racial inequities and what more needs to happen. But even more concretely, I think there's much more that the federal government can and should do to help local communities or force or require local communities to remove this restrictive zoning. And unfortunately, I think we just had a big missed opportunity with the bipartisan infrastructure package that the president signed into law yesterday. Because, you know, for some time there have been conversations about how do you tie some of the federal investments that go to communities to requirements to, to remove some of this restrictive zoning. And most of those conversations are around the housing dollars, which can have an impact, but I think it will be pretty minimal. And I think we need to think much bigger than that because we'll also have communities who prefer to just forego those housing dollars altogether in order to keep their community as it is. If we think much bigger and we think about the big transportation and infrastructure dollars, the highway dollars, the money for repairing bridges that communities really want, and we tie either um, uh, incentives or requirements to those funds, that's where we'll have a bigger impact, I think. So unfortunately, we had a missed opportunity there with the, with the bipartisan infrastructure package. But in future, um, even annual spending bills, I think we have to think bigger and do more. And that's also a place where there has been more bipartisan willingness in Congress to look at local zoning and, you know, when you get more granular, you realize that when people say zoning or regulation, they mean very different things. Yes. Uh, but I think there is a, there is a place for um, agreement, bipartisan agreement about needing 
the federal government to do more on state and local zoning. So we'll keep pushing on that at the federal level as you keep pushing on it at the state yeah. level. Yep. Long, it's been a long haul for those of us in this space and the changes that we got through this year were ones that have been, you know, really in the works for over a decade. So um, it is a slow go, but any help at the federal level in that space, I think will be important in sending the message of why that's why that's so critical to tie infrastructure and housing together in particular. Yeah. Um, uh, when, what was my last question? <laughs> um, just taking a look to see if we have any others popping up. Um, a question about elderly, growing elderly population on fixed incomes, um, often extremely low. You touched on that a little bit, but I'll hit that before my last question and see if you have any updates you want to give there. Connecticut is um, not surprisingly, as you may know, an aging state. Um, population growth here is extremely slow. So it is an area of concern, especially where we don't have, as we just talked about, a lot of um, those downsizing units available for folks um, who are aging and looking to age in place in their communities um, on a fixed income. Anything on the federal level that you can cite that you um, see as a bright spot there, assistance coming along that way? Well, again, I would point back to those investments in the Build Back Better Act, because all of them could be used to help seniors, aging seniors, um, leave, live in decent, safe, and affordable homes. I think I'd point to, because I haven't talked about it that much yet, at the, the public housing funding there. You know, much of the public housing stock throughout the country has fallen into really deep disrepair in recent decades um, because the federal government has been starving public housing agencies of the funds that they need to keep those units up. And some of those units are just in such... Um, such bad shape, uh, creating all kinds of additional health and mental health consequences for the people who live there. And uh, a really significant number of public housing units um, have seniors in them. Seniors rely on public housing as a way to have dignity and safe housing into their retirement. So um, it has been a shameful neglect by the federal government. And this is now an opportunity to really make up for decades of neglect with a $65 billion investment that could repair most, if not all public housing throughout the country into really decent quality homes. Um, but also the, the Section 8 vouchers and the Housing Trust Fund money certainly would help uh, low-income seniors have affordable housing options as well. Yeah, absolutely, great. Um, so I guess in closing, we only have a, a few minutes left. Um, I'll ask a question with sort of a positive bent on it since it's been a challenging couple of years, but as you said, there's been some really um, positive things to come out of it, I think. Um, some hard lessons that folks have learned and that's a good thing. Um, but what are you most hopeful about in the coming year? Is it, are there some sort of legislative efforts you see underway, uh, changes in, um, congressional leadership that have changed the tone? What are you seeing that, that gives you hope for the next year? I am singularly nearly focused on the Build Back Better Act and getting those investments enacted. Because again, it, we talk about hopefulness, uh, you know, the possibility of having a total of $150 billion in federal housing investments. Again, it's historic and having over 70% of those funds targeted to the lowest income people where the need is the greatest. We have to get this done. You know, when I talk about it's been decades in the making, I think that's clear and obvious, but the possibility of it being decades more until this opportunity comes back again, it's very real that this, this moment, we have to seize it. We have to ensure that these resources um, are appropriated. And then we have to do the same hard work that we've been doing during the pandemic with the emergency rental assistance in ensuring that these funds get to the people who need it the most, get there quickly, create the kind of jobs that are needed at the local level and ensure that those jobs are being filled by the lowest income and most marginalized people in those communities, in those homes. There's a lot of work ahead, um, but I feel hopeful and I feel, I feel concerned um, that we may not meet this moment and we must. So I just want to, again, call on everybody. Thank you all again for all of the advocacy you've done and to say, 
you can still do more. And I, and I hope that you will still do more. And even if your congressional delegation is on board, keep calling them, keep asking them, what are they doing to ensure that these resources are enacted? And let's get this done this year. Diane, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. I'll note too, for those that are here, um, the partnership is the state uh, partner for the National Income Housing Coalition. So we do share federal advocacy alerts with all of you. So to Diane's last point, um, if you're not on the partnership listserv or the National Income Housing Coalition listserv, I encourage you to sign up for that. It gives you a key of when you need to make those phone calls and, and what about and some great information coming through. So um, thanks again, Diane. We really appreciate your time today and sharing your thoughts on um, what has been a really um, difficult, but also fascinating and encouraging year in some ways. And thank you most importantly for your work and that of your awesome staff um, who have been really working hard at the federal level to um, carry forth a lot of the needs that are amazing, heroic um, folks that are on this call, both in the housing development and, and homelessness space have been raising up. So thank you for all the work that you keep doing. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. Um, for folks who are remaining with us for the rest of the day or for the next session, I just want to let you know that the next session is Housing Connecticut's Future, Meeting the State's Affordable and Accessible Housing Needs. That is at 11, followed by Affordable Housing Opportunities from Pandemic Impacted Commercial Real Estate, followed, as I noted before, by the legislative roundtable that we discussed. And that full agenda is um, on the conference website and in the lobby, which you're already logged into if you're in this session. Um, just want to note, too, before we close out, I mentioned this yesterday for those of you who weren't um, with us, though, save the date for Thursday, December 16th. It's the partnership's fourth and final I-Forum of the year. It's going to be called Pathways to Achieving Race Equity in Housing and Homelessness. So if you were with us yesterday, a lot of the sessions were focusing on racial inequities, and you heard Diane talk about that today. The focus of that session will be on dismantling systemic racism in the housing and homelessness um, system and how we can better apply a racial equity lens at all levels, including organizational, policy, advocacy, research, and community engagement. A lot of partners continually ask, how do we get started in that space? Um, and so the iForm will explore a lot of that. We're welcoming Peggy Bailey, Senior Advisor um, at HUD, Amanda Indire, CEO of Funders Together, and Susan Thomas, President of the Melville Charitable Trust for that event again on Thursday, December 16th. Uh, so more information to come. If you're not signed up for the partnership listserv, please do that. Um, we'll, we also blast it out on our social media if that's how you hear. Um, hear about things, then clue into that. Um, our Twitter handle is also posted on the slides at the beginning of the sessions. Um, and lastly, as Connecticut vaccination rates continue to grow, we have opened the Lyceum for those of you who know our historic building, that conference center is available um, for trainings and presentations or events or whatever you may be looking to um, host. So please feel free to connect through our website on that along with Jane Peters, our Director of Administration, who helps manage that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you learned a lot from Diane, as I did and always do when I hear her speak. Um, look forward to the rest of the sessions today. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day, everyone.